it is wonderful to have you all with us this, this, this evening. It is uh, great to see everybody. We are uh, teasing that everyone sits in the back, and so all of the folks who are going to be joining us later are going to get to um, have a special welcome as they come up to the front. So this is an informal family gathering, the Ford School family, and so I hope you'll encourage people to come up to the, to the front as they come in. So good evening. I'm Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, and it is great to see both a number of familiar faces, I look forward to talking with you afterwards, but also a number of new faces, and I look forward to talking with you as well. Um, with help from many of you in this room, Jennifer Niggemeyer and Elizabeth Johnson have put together a really exciting two days, um, both activities today and activities that are going on tomorrow, and um, career panels that have included, I think, about 40 Ford School students on the trip. And so uh, I look forward to hearing about those, but I hope that they've been as productive as they promised to be. Um, You've come this evening for a keynote event, which has become a tradition as part of our DC trip. And uh, tonight we have a conversation where I will be joined by two very distinguished economists and friends um, who I will introduce later. One is my colleague, Professor Marina Whitman, and the second is um, Peterson Institute Senior Fellow, Ted Truman. And I will give more formal introductions in just a few moments. Um, I'd like to start, though, by giving you a little bit of Ford School news. The first item of news is a very sad piece of news, and that is that someone who was a beloved longtime member of the Ford School community, a faculty member, Michael Cohen, who those who were um, active in the Ford School during its IPS days will probably remember very fondly, um, died unexpectedly over the past weekend. Uh, he had been battling cancer for a long time, but um, it was a surprise and a shock, and so we were very saddened by that. Um, there is information about a service this weekend that's on our website, and also about the very many contributions that he made. He was one of the um, really core intellectual faculty members who helped transition IPS into a school, and he was also one of the founding members of the school of information and so has had a great many contributions to the university more generally as well. So I encourage those of you who remember him to take a look at our website uh, for more information. Um, I also wanted to share some exciting Ford School news that um, I hope that you will uh, join us in activities related to, and that is that we are starting celebrations for two back-to-back -back centennials. 2013, as many of you know, marks the 100th anniversary of President Ford. And we have a number of special activities that are already underway to commemorate his life and his legacy. Um, Brent Scrowcroft will visit the Ford School later this semester to dedicate a maquette, a small, uh, smaller version of the statue of President Ford that sits in the Capitol Rotunda, which we will have in our Great Hall. And I uh, hope many of you will join us there for that. And Paul O'Neill, who was a uh, former uh, Treasury Secretary, will be our commencement speaker this year in honor of, again, what would have been the um, 100th anniversary of President Ford's birth. But of course, it's, it's all of you in so many ways, our students and our alumni and members of our community who really continue the legacy and the, um, the many contributions that President Ford made to public service. And you're really one of our best ambassadors uh, throughout that. And we're so proud of all the things that you do. I'm going to ask you to help us celebrate that centennial in a way that I hope you'll think is fun as well as, um, whoops, as well as um, helping to spread the word about the school and helping us to kick off the centennial. And that is our button celebration. So you see that uh, I'm wearing a button. Many of you took buttons as you came in. Um, our speakers, our panelists have their buttons. And I hope that you will demonstrate your pride of the Ford School and wear it all around Washington and in your travels and all the places that you might be. Um, we're working on the details, but in fact, we are about to launch um, a special uh, Ford School picture of your button with President Ford, and you might have seen the ad for it. 
it uh, out on the table. Um, and so the idea is to go through all of your contacts lists and see who is influential and impressive or just a really cool person that you would like to have a photo of wearing our Ford School pin, our 100th celebration of President Ford pin. Um, so get a picture, send it to us, and we will have a really special prize for uh, who is designated as the winner of that fun contest. So you'll be hearing more about that, and I hope you join us uh, with, that, uh, with that little contest as well. Um, in 2014, the school celebrates its 100th anniversary, and so that is the second of our back-to-back -back centennials. And we're planning a number of activities and events. Stay tuned. Certainly one of them is going to be a reunion for alumni, and we hope to announce the date in the coming months and look forward to seeing uh, all of you and all of your Ford School friends joining us for that event. Um, I hope that you all saw the most recent edition of the Ford School feed. If you didn't, let us know because we want to update your email address and make sure that you are on our card, uh, on our, our list for that. And I hope that uh, all of you put your business cards in. Um, if you didn't, I think Cliff and Jennifer were collecting, maybe Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth and Amy as well were collecting cards. Um, we always do a, a special drawing, so let me let me get the basket, and I will. Last minute cards. There we go. It's it's great for us to be able to stay in touch with all of you. But oh, wonderful. Okay. Okay. Ah, we've got some more. Andrew has one. Deep, deep, okay, deep. dig deep. And I'm not looking. <laughs> and we have Keith Fudge. <laughs> <laughs> never, never. Um, so we also have a special prize for our winner. And this is our prize winner. Now, I know that further north there's going to be a huge blizzard. I don't think we're quite going to get the blizzard here. At least I hope not. Maybe just some rain. But Keith, you're going to be very warm because we have a Ford School um, travel mug for your coffee on your morning walk. And we also have a scarf for you. So um, I will leave that there. And, uh... OK. So now for our main event this evening. Um, we are very fortunate to be joined by Ted Truman, who is a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. And he was a former assistant secretary for the US Treasury of International Affairs under President Clinton. Um, I got to know him when he was the longtime director of the division of um, the International Affairs Division of the Federal Reserve Board and is uh, has enjoyed staying in touch with him throughout the years and look forward to hearing his th thoughtful remarks later this evening. Also joining us is our esteemed Ford School Michigan colleague, uh, Professor Marina Whitman, who of course is both at the School of Public Policy and the Ross School of Business. She was a member of President Nixon's Council of Economic Advisors among a number of uh, very interesting career positions. And uh, many of you may have seen her recent memoir, The Martian's Daughter, which was published this past fall by the University of Michigan Press. And for those of you who haven't read it, I highly recommend it. It is both a fascinating read, history, economics, very thoughtful, and a very, very uh, interesting life. And um, I encourage you to take a look at it. There's actually a sample copy of it out there. Um, so both Marina and Ted have had careers that are really dedicated to understanding the U.S. economy and its role in the international system from a variety of different vantage points. Um, as we look at what's happening today, the intertwining of economies is increasing, and there are severe challenges that certainly the U.S. is facing, that Europe, Asia, emerging markets, um, and again, they're increasingly intertwined. And so we're very fortunate, I think, to have the range of expertise that both Ted and Marina bring to this topic for our conversation this evening. So here's our format. We're going to start out by inviting Ted to um, launch our discussion by giving some initial remarks about the outlook and his perspective. And then he'll join me and Marina for an initial conversation 
um, between the three of us. I want to leave at least 20 minutes for questions from the audience. So I encourage you to think about what you want to ask him, but the three of us more generally, during the initial part of the discussion. Um, and then we'll invite you to come to the speaker, uh, which is over there, to ask questions for the last part of the session. So with that, why don't we get started? And I am delighted to invite Ted to give his remarks. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. Um, I was joking that Mr. Fudge gets to ask the first question. And if no one asks the first question, we're going to call on you. Um, so it is a pleasure to be here with Marina and, uh, and Susan this evening. I've known, uh, I won't reveal how long I've known the two of them. I have known Marina longer than I've known Susan. i uh, leave it at that. And my, uh, my connections with Michigan are um, several, but somewhat uh, tenuous. Uh, but maybe of some marginal interest. So my wife's uh, great uncle taught at the law school. And more interestingly, in some respects, her, uh, his wife, whose name was Margaret Tracy, was a professor of economics there before World War II. So, for, uh, so this was an example of uh, Michigan being substantially ahead of its time, I think. And my wife's mother graduated there. From there, and then the summer of 1958, I spent in Ann Arbor while my father was working with the America Votes uh, project, uh, and I played a lot of golf. Uh, and that's the only course on which I've ever broken a hundred. Uh, uh, then nine years later, when I was on the job market, I visited Ann Arbor and was not deemed worthy of an offer. Uh, but uh, we have, I have been back a number of a number of times. Actually, I have a relative who lives in, in Ann Arbor. Uh, and uh, to date, we do root, tend to root for Michigan, do root for Michigan in the Big Ten, uh, including during the uh, basketball game last Saturday night. Uh, but that's only until the Maryland Terps join the Big Ten. Uh, <laughs> so uh, this evening, we're supposed to be discussing developments of the US economy and policy and implications for the world. And I'm going to bend slightly the topic by thinking also of things the other way around, uh, the implications of the world for the U.S. economy. Uh, because as Susan mentioned in her introductory remarks, we live in a, a, a joint world, a general equilibrium system, which I was recently learned we're supposed to call now a complex adaptive system that is always in disequilibrium. This is, I'm sure you learn this in school these days. Uh, I just learned it yesterday. Um, <laughs> I'm going to uh, cover sort of four uh, subtopics. One, the outlook for the U.S. and the global economy, which continues as a uh, timid uh, subpar recovery. Uh, then a little bit on Europe, uh, which may resume growth this year, but faces, a, I think, a decade of stagnation. Uh, the te tepid U.S. recovery uh, will continue, uh, but we will make a marginal net contribution to the global economic activity in contrast to the half a percent a year that we contributed in the, in the middle part of the 19, uh, 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 the early part of the 19, this that past decade, and uh, the one percent a year actually the rest of the world contributed to us in 2007 to 9. And then you have the, uh, the, uh, the emerging market in developing countries, uh, which will continue to grow fast and faster than the advanced countries. But their growth will be substantially be below their uh, pre-crisis pace, uh, which I think demonstrates the fact that they <clears throat> have not decoupled. I remember, actually, Susan, you've written on this subject, haven't you? And that they cannot alone uh, uh, drive uh, global growth back to uh, uh, potential. And then also, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the United States and Europe and their respective child policy challenges, ours being more of a political paralysis uh, with little effect on the rest of the world so far, and Europe being much more serious with very large effects on the world so far. And lastly, as a former uh, central banker, uh, and it's still slightly more uh, respectable to be a former central banker than a former treasury official, um, uh, central banks are controversial in the world today, and the issue of currency, world, currency wars are one manifestation. Uh, they're more real than imagined, uh, more imagined than real in my view, but they illustrate some of the potential challenges in the world today. So on the outlook, 
uh, Christine Lagarde, the managing director of the National Monetary Fund, recently opined that the outlook was for a timid recovery, uh, and her comment coincided with the latest World Bank, I mean IMF's uh, projection for the world of three and a half percent growth this year. Uh, and the word timid is justified by the fact that there certainly are risks to the outlook, and by the fact that for more than two years the IMF staff in putting together its outlook has marked progressively marked down the outlook. Uh, for, say, this year. Uh, indeed, for the, the level of global economic activity uh, is now projected for this year to be three percentage points lower than was anticipated two years ago. Uh, uh, and, and even then, they were hardly uh, projecting a, uh, a boom. And that, if you want to have some number, the two numbers associate with it, that, that is one and a half trillion dollars, two and a half trillion dollars, or three hundred dollars per capita uh, globally. And in my view, most of this lost output is attributed to the failure of the Europeans to decisively address their the euro debt crisis, uh, and that failure has adversely affected uh, us, the United States, and we have not had the policy scope to compensate. Um, so a little bit more on on the three pieces of the puzzle. Uh, the IMF now projects that the euro area will have a shortfall in the same sense I used it before uh, of four and a half percent. And the explanation for this bleak outlook is their failure to address and resolve the debt crises. Early, three years ago, in early 2010, the European authorities failed decisively and comprehensively to address the Greek crisis, and the result was a spread of economic and financial contagion, both within Europe and abroad. And the inevitable fiscal belt tightening in the program countries, the countries in crisis, which now are five, or Cyprus is six, makes them six, uh, uh, has been accompanied by a fiscal contraction, which is inevitable. But there also has been fiscal contraction in the rest of the euro area. Uh, which has in turn exacerbated the slowdowns and recessions, uh, roughly by twice as much, uh, half as much in the other countries like Germany, France, Austria, the Netherlands, as in the program countries. And this generalized fiscal austerity and the fact that the European Central Bank has been behind the eight ball, not behind permanently, but behind the eight ball, which doesn't mean that they've never done anything, have exacerbated the, the crises and this in the financial situation with negative effects on the world as a whole. And even with a mild recovery that the, uh, the IMF uh, projects for in, in 2014, if you take their numbers over the 10 years ending in 2017, the euro area will average growth of one half percent uh, per year. So that's what I mean by stagnation. And I think the point is that no region has been immune from this sort of uh, this uh, slowdown and the, and the spillovers from the euro debt crisis, which I think demonstrates the point that it's largely their uh, problems rather than a surge in commodity prices or uh, or other things that might you might point to the uh, Arab Spring, whatever it might be. So the projected shortfall in U.S. economic activity is about 2.5 percent on the same basis. Uh, but uh, uh, and uh, even with the uh, uh, and we're supposed to get maybe close to that uh, at growth this year. Uh, 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 excuse me, 2 percent this year um, with some pickup in the second half of the year. Um, but this is the broad consensus, but uh, more recently, I think, uh, as, as uh, forecasting you know, lags, facts, uh, sometimes seriously. Uh, uh, and uh, I was interested to note that the Congressional Budget Office came out with a forecast for this year now, which is closer to 1.5% uh, two days ago, um, based on the fact that not only have we had the tax deal, uh, but it looks like the federal sequester. Um, will go into effect largely as well. Um, and as far as the emerging market and developing countries are concerned, they're projected to grow uh, 
uh, at five and a half percent this year, but that compares with eight percent a year on average in the pre-crisis period. Uh, and their shortfall on the same basis is about two and a half percent. And again, every region of the world has a shortfall. Uh, and basically, I think that demonstrates that they have not decoupled from the advanced countries and they lack the capacity to propel by themselves global growth back to uh, potential. Uh, no group, as I said, has been immune. Uh, for example, even in Asia, developing Asia, which we think is the most dynamic, uh, on the same basis, their, uh, their, their outlook this year, the level of economic activity in the emerging market in developing countries in Asia is expected to be 4 percent lower than was projected uh, uh, two years ago. So what about the United States and uh, Europe? I should say in advance, it's going to sound like I'm beating up on Europe, but I'm, I started out doing my work on, on Europe when I went to Michigan to do my job interview, and I gave, actually gave my uh, paper on trade creation and trade diversion in the European uh, economic community. Maybe that's why they didn't hire me. Uh, um, so the principal difference between the crises in Europe uh, and the United States, uh, if you want to call them that, is that in Europe, you have economic crises combined with political crises, which in turn have exacerbated the economic crisis. And in the United States, we've only, only, quote unquote, had essentially political paralysis associated with our incapacity to achieve consensus over the shape and timing of getting our fiscal house in order. So one question is uh, whether the United States has been fiscally profligate, and opinions on this, of course, can differ. The IMF estimated last fall that over the three years ending this year, the United States will have reduced its cyclically adjusted general government budget position by three and a half, three and a third percentage points of potential GDP. Uh, and that probably is now an underestimate, by the way. And the rule of thumb, which they pronounce for countries who are in good shape, uh, is that prudent adjustments in fiscal position should be more on the order of one, uh, three quarters to one percent a year. So we could be even overdoing it by that standard. Um, but I think the basic point is, you guys are living, or mostly many of you live and work in Washington, so uh, you may not agree with this. But I would argue that the underlying debate in the United States uh, about fiscal policy is not whether the budget deficit is, uh, uh, and the buildup of government debt, it should be cut, uh, but how fast, how far, and by what means, which is a relatively simple set of questions. Anybody can do it with a spreadsheet. They may not all come up with the same answer, come up with the same. And we have not had a crisis, and any serious uh, crisis, but yet, but any serious crisis clearly would reverberate around the world. But today, the rest of the world, uh, in my opinion, is uh, more worried that we'll be do too much too soon rather than wait too long. In other words, our political paralysis has not yet seriously affected the world economy. Ken Rogoff, another former colleague of mine, uh, recently wrote in the Financial Times that the world is right uh, to worry about uh, U.S. Uh, debt, but that at the end of the article, that was the headline, in the end of the article it said, a little bit, <laughs> which I think is probably about right. Um, in contrast, the European crisis started out as a traditional macroeconomic banking crisis, uh, uh, which normally are resolved by in six or nine months these days. Europe is in its fourth year. And uh, the reason is that the European leaders have bickered about how to address the immediate causes, and at the same time, they have engaged in an existential debate concerning the future of the euro uh, after six day, decades of progressive European economic and financial integration. Um, and finally, during this past summer, it was agreed that the euro is irreversible. And then that decision lasted just a few, until a few weeks ago when the German finance minister said, suggested maybe Cyprus is an exception. Uh, uh, now, to be fair, sympathetic observers argue that delays in the European decision making are a necessary complement to fundamental long term economic governance reforms and are necessary to force recalcitrant political leaders in affected countries to take tough measures and to deal with the problem of moral hazard. And the euro area may observe, uh, emerge stronger from the crisis, and in fact, I, that would be my best guess. 
But meanwhile, I think it's fair to say that the heavy economic toll has been extracted not only in Europe but, as I've demonstrated, around the world, and there is some considerable risk of further political uh, unraveling. As one headline I saw uh, this past week said, quote, bond yields rise as market discover, markets discover that the crisis may not be over after all. So that brings me to my last uh, subtopic, currency wars. Um, with the global recovery well below par, central banks have kept their feet on the respective accelerators led by the Federal Reserve. And that has been uh, controversial. Uh, and one area of the international controversy has been captured by this term, currency wars. So uh, I do do a little teaching these days, so this is, comes to, this is the teaching part of my talk. Um, so let's uh, unpack uh, this term. Uh, in a world of low inflation, fiscal policy that is largely paralyzed, like it, or, like it or not, monetary policy and for those countries with the scope, exchange rate policy are the only tools available to stimulate their economies in the short run. So we want, want to step back and ask ourselves what we mean by exchange rate policy in this context. And one possibility is what is called by economists oral intervention. That's expression of, expressions of official opinion that a currency is too strong, which are largely, home, uh, largely harmless. They make good headlines in the Financial Times, but that's about all. Um, and they show the, the people uh, that, that, that the officials care. Um, uh, sort of feel-good stuff. Uh, second candidate is active purchases of foreign, uh, foreign currency to drive the country's currency down. Um, which is of questionable lasting effectiveness, except in countries that are sort of disengaged from the global financial markets. And a third uh, candidate is directing monetary policy at an explicit exchange rate objective, as Switzerland is doing, which is somewhat more problematic for the rest of the world, depending on the circumstances of the particular country. But I would argue that the aggressive use of monetary policy, as we generally understand it, through the purchase of domestic assets, uh, in order to address weaknesses in economic and financial conditions, as has been done by the Federal Reserve, is something else, and should not be a major source of global concern, but of course it is. And the, the counter-argument uh, is that Federal Reserve expansionary policy has two offsetting effects. On the one hand, it tends to depreciate the dollar, but thereby absorbing demand from the rest of the world. And on the other hand, it tends to stimulate domestic investment and consumption, thereby adding to global demand. And the net effect on the rest of the world may be either positive or negative, but it's small, because you're taking a plus and a minus, and if you take them together, they're going to be smaller absolute value than either. Um, uh, and it's approximately zero in the US case. Uh, now, different countries may be affected differently, so it's zero on average. Uh, and the problem, I think, is that uh, other countries may focus on the negative effects and not ignore the positive effects. But what we do know uh, is that tensions and risks are increased. And the bottom line, we also know, is that all countries can't devalue their way to prosperity at the same time, assuming they can devalue their way to prosperity at all, which is questionable. Uh, and the risk is that in trying to do so, trade and other frictions will increase. In other words, we live in an interconnected world in which every country can and should have views about its own policies as well as those of other countries, uh, as I've tried to illustrate tonight. So I hope I've given you all, including Marina and Susan, something to think about, and I welcome our discussion of these issues as well as anything else is on your mind. Thank you. Chance to sit down. Um, Ted, let me start by asking you to unpack a bit more uh, a couple of related comments that you made um, that the, your, the EU clearly had a crisis, whereas the United States didn't. It merely had a paralysis at, at the moment. 
And secondly, that while the European situation was having negative effects on uh, other countries, the United States was not. Uh, and despite the significant contractionary effect of, of US fiscal policy. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about those distinctions and why you make them so clearly. Well, I think partly I, it's a question of sort of looking back and saying what really has changed over the last two years. Uh, and although lots of things have been on, going on in the world, on the, you know, commodity prices have gone down. That helps some countries, but not others, right? In general, they've gone down. Uh, uh, but the, uh, there have been other events, economic and uh, political. Uh, we haven't grown, right? Uh, uh, if you're a devotee of Paul Krugman, we could have done a lot better. That's a different issue in some sense. Uh, but we sort of have uh, muddled through. Uh, uh, so the sort of net effect on the world has been small, right? Uh, and in the European case, uh, they, they sort of magnify their own problems, partly because they're all tied together. The countries are all tied together. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and that sort of, the internal linkages magnifies each other, as well as some of the policy aspects of it, uh, as I suggested. And you've had a lot of uncertainty generated by the in, international financial markets. Uh, I mean, you actually see articles in the newspapers, and I suspect uh, more academic things, uh, which say, in some sense, the unusual period in which events in Europe have been driving day-to-day uh, -day movements in financial markets. Right? And one of the sets, not, not continuously over time, but one of the features was just a, uh, a general rise in risk aversion, right, which has affected the emerging market in our countries. Right? So money has come back into the dollar in particular, uh, Swiss franc, which is one of their problems, the, the yen. Um, uh, as, and that has adversely affected the emerging market in developing countries, and that has a further feedback effect on, uh, on the United States. Uh, and the sort of the major component of the increase uh, increases in risk aversion over this couple last couple of two or three years has been the European crisis and whether they're going to have a, a big uh, bankruptcy, uh, a national bankruptcy or not. So that's that's the logic that I would use uh, to make that uh, argument about Europe. And in our case, we obviously could have done better, right? Uh, but they, uh, for better or for worse, I mean, some people even say for worse, there hasn't been any financial market. Uh, manifestation of our, particularly of our man of, of our uh, incapacity to uh, incapacity to uh, figure out what we want to do with fiscal situation over the medium term, uh, uh, and uh, so I that's the that's basically the argument. Now that doesn't mean that you know uh, we certainly have the capacity to do this, so, uh, but we hope we that doesn't happen. The whole kind of thesis that your talk was on had to do with these repercussions in, in both directions or in all directions. And a lot of the mechanisms by which this occurs were implicit in what you said. But I was wondering if you could sort of say explicitly and sort of fairly briefly, what are those different mechanisms by which countries affect each other economically? Well, they're clear. I mean, they're obviously, as you say, if you, your question implies, they're multiple. So there is trade, right, uh, which in turn is linked to economic activity. There is uh, uh, finance in terms of financial flows as well, both financial flows and direct investment flows. Uh, there are uh, monetary uh, financial market conditions, including uh, risk premium on various types of assets. So look, I think you have all those different different channels. Now, not, they don't all work the same way. I mean, in some sense, one reason why we have, uh, it's not just the Federal Reserve, which is driving down long-term interest rates in the United States, is because the European crisis is driving down long-term interest rates in the United States. Uh, and indeed, over the last, uh, over the last uh, several months, You've had a backup, and the backup is probably only getting slightly above 2%. It's hard to argue that it's a backup, but you've had a rise of 
30 to 50 basis points in uh, long-term interest rates in the, in the United States, even as you've had the same rise in long-term interest rates in uh, government interest rates in, 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 in Germany, which reflects a somewhat calmer situation. Uh, so you have all those kind of channels, it seems to me, that are they're affecting, affecting uh, uh, the system uh, as a whole. And, um, uh, and, and we are bound more together. I mean, again, I think it's, it is impressive uh, that not only in the global financial crisis itself, uh, uh, but in this um, European coda, uh, all, not all countries, that's, that'd be too much, but all regions of the world have been affected similarly. Right? So you think of other, the other major period in the post-war, two other major period in the post-war period, where you had sort of global events were the, the um, oil price crisis uh, in the 70s, where well, you had lots of countries going into the recession, but not everybody did. Uh, and the uh, and the and the global recession come debt crisis of the early 80s, but again, if you look at the data, not everybody was going down at the same time. Not every bloody region of the world had a lower growth last year than the, the, the year before, uh, which is pretty remarkable to have that given the sort of you think about the diversity of countries and regions of the world, it's pretty remarkable to have that. And I think that just is demonstration of the fact that we're all tied together even more than we used to be, which is partly how you, why you add things like the G20 and so forth and so on uh, being wheeled into action. So I'm, I'm going to jump in with a question and just play devil's advocate and push you a little bit further, and then I think we should open things up to the audience. So if I wanted to um, argue that perhaps you are letting the U.S. off the hook, and that your argument suggests that the U.S. Uh, is much less to blame for the challenges of pulling this very interlocked global economy um, out of the challenges that they're all facing. Um, so I wonder what you would say to the view that um, what's happened in the U.S. is that with a spreadsheet, you could have figured out how to deal with this fiscal problem, as you suggested. Um, one way to have dealt with it, and Krugman is one, but there are many who would argue in this direction, but one way to deal with that would have been to make it very clear that there was a long-term plan and that it was the debt and the fiscal problems were going to be addressed over time, but to be much more expansionary in the short run, and possibly we wouldn't have seen the very poor growth in the last quarter, and the U.S. would have provided much more of an engine of growth globally, and that's a very different scenario than the one you painted, and relative to that one, it sounds like the U.S. has more to, to account for well, I, than you suggest. Yeah, well, I did say the United States could do better, could have done better, right? And, and what you lay out, I think, is, uh, is one thing I, I would subscribe to. So if, if you and I were uh, the uh, economic czar and czarina, uh, we probably could sit down and you know figure this out, right? And one thing would be why didn't why didn't weren't we able to say well we have this long term plan, which addresses the long term issues of uh, entitlements and associated issues, right? And then we have the short term issue, uh, a short term plan, and we and, and by anchoring the longer term expectations, you have more scope in the short run uh, to be more expansionary, which makes a lot of sense. I'm interested, by the way, just to be slightly mm, provocative and personal. Uh, I mean, so as you mentioned, I was at the Treasury for the Treasury for a while, and uh, and therefore was working with uh, with uh, Larry Summers when he was both Deputy Secretary and Under Secretary. And the interesting thing is that over the last year, his Financial Times op-eds have reversed on that. Right, so he was he was he was a Krugmanite a year ago, and his most recent one was the other way around. He said we have to tack down the long run, and then we have more scope in the short run. And uh, I mean that's even extracting the fact that we probably were in the wrong position when he started, right? Uh, uh, but that's sort of that's spilt milk, right? So I think we certainly could have done better, and that we would have been better, and because we would have been better off. Uh, 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 the world would have been better off. Uh, 
though I have a tendency to, I mean, it's not again a false analogy. So, so uh, those are sins of omission, if we may put it that way. We failed to do what we should have done. Uh, and I think in the European case, uh, at least viewed from the perspective of uh, a student of financial crises, uh, they had sins of commission. Right? They were not. They the advice they had was to use massive policy and financial force to stop the contagion, uh, and they were unable. I think that's the right word. I don't know that unable to do so. That certainly was the you want to put it to be crude about it, but we are in Washington after all. That was the advice that they were getting, as far as I know, from the, from the administration. Right? You know, you, you have a crisis. The way to deal with the crisis is you use overwhelming force. Powell Doctrine is sometimes referred to. Um, and they didn't have the, uh, the, the, the governance capacity to do that because they didn't trust each other enough. Uh, and therefore, they, they, you know, they sort of uh, muddled through, and that meant the things got worse and worse. That's the sense in which I think the, the distinction about omission and commission may be a little exaggerated, but that's what we're here for. So I suspect we could continue this, but why don't we open things up and see if anyone would like to ask a question or uh, share a perspective. Um, we have a microphone that's here. Um, I want to make sure that people can hear. So please uh, come, on, come on up and ask your question. Welcome. Hi. So uh, my name is Noor Shamut. I'm a student from Jordan. Um, I do not know if we can say that the Arab Spring affected the US economy. But I can, um, I mean, this is a speculative question. I, this is the first time that we are living in a world that has uh, more people living in urban places than rural. And I wonder how we can, how the U.S. is ready for this or how it will affect the U.S. economy in general, this, this paradigm shift in the world. Uh, well, my answer would be, though I'm looking for help, <laughs> uh, Susan. Uh, she's done a lot of work on these long-term trends, but I don't know where that's one of them. Uh, in some sense, it's a, it's a long-term trend, yes. right? Uh, we may have we reached a tipping point, just as we've reached a pip, tipping point in, sen in the sense that emerging market developing countries now account for more than 50% of global GDP on a PPP term. So we've made, reached a sort of tipping point, uh, that, and I think you know, you're, you're right. So, and the world is much more complicated, uh, difficult to manage, right? So we've got, the way I tell the story is, so the story is, if you live in New York and there's a problem, like a big snowstorm, the whole place shuts down. If you live in Washington, which is a big city, or a small city, by your reasonably big, medium-sized city by U.S. standards, uh, not by Chinese standards, uh, it's a village. Uh, if you have a big snowstorm, right, uh, you can handle it. In D.C.? If you have a small snowstorm, you can't <laughs> handle it. No, 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 no. You have to know how to handle the, Europe, the, 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 the people who live here, right, who don't know how to drive in snow. Uh, but the truth of the matter is you can, you can, you can walk home, right? Uh, uh, many people, not everybody, but you can walk home. So the city is, the city is much more manageable as, a, as an entity. It doesn't uh, break down so much, and so you actually need more complicated. A better, another example is, uh, which is, uh, I didn't realize this until I was talking to somebody in the administration. So we had this big hurricane, Sandy. Uh, uh, and, uh, and just as was the case with uh, New Orleans, but we all had read about that, people have been apparently warning about a big hurricane in New York City for decades and saying you were un we were unprepared. right? because the infrastructure was not there to deal with that many people in those kinds of circumstances. And as someone who spent half of growing up in New York City, the fact that you found subways flooded, you know, it blew my mind. I mean, I've lived there for 10 years, right? So I never heard of any subways being flooded. So there are these, these more complicated problems, and I think it makes it more difficult to, uh, difficult to, uh, if you don't get them right, it really gets, you end up with much bigger disaster, right? If you're off on some, in Hillsdale, New York, you can, you know, you can go out and 
or I'd have a country place. That's why I use that example. Right? You can go off, you cut your own wood, right? You can shoot your own deer, right? Uh, assuming you have a license to carry a gun. Um, uh, and so it's much simpler. The life is more complicated. But maybe you could be optimistic about it. I mean, I think it's, uh, I, I heard on the radio, you may actually, so this is the birthday of this famous American writer by the, uh, Sinclair Lewis. And he wrote a book called Main Street, which I must have read when I was 16, that summer in, uh, that summer in, uh, in Ann Arbor. Uh, but it actually made fun of Main Street. It made fun of uh, a small town in America, right? which is not exactly what we've actually been doing when we're talking about Main Street versus Wall Street over the last, last several years. So, and that's, so there's a certain sense in which we've made, I don't know whether it's progress, but change. So, let me just add a couple of thoughts to that. I mean, you said, is the U.S. ready? I, I think essentially that there are a lot of changes that we're still grappling with, not just the U.S., but more generally. And let me just highlight a couple of trends which um, Ted talked about. One is um, there's the way that risks play out when people are concentrated are quite different. And so there are these small probabilities of catastrophic events. And I think arguably dealing with those is more challenging when people are more concentrated because there's a, there's a you know, impacts more people and more activity in small areas. So one issue related to um, that increased concentration is how you manage those small probabilities of things that are catastrophic. I don't think we know well how to deal with that. I think that's a huge challenge which relates to infrastructure. Um, we also have seen in, in China in particular the growing um, urbanization and congestion and some of the major environmental challenges and I think some of those sustainability trends and issues are things we're grappling with um, throughout the world and it's not something we've solved, certainly. At the same time, some of the pluses have to do with the fact that there are agglomeration economies. So to the extent that things are interconnected, there are a lot of activities that actually are perhaps more productive. And so they're both pluses and minuses. So have we figured that out? Absolutely not. I think it's a really interesting, challenging thing that has pluses and minuses like most parts of, of what we see happening out there. So really interesting question. There, there is another long-term tipping point, if you want to put it that way, which interacts with these others, both the urbanization and the issue of the growing significance of the developing countries. And that is the e drop below replacement birth rates oh, in virtually all of the rich countries, which means that, um, and, and actually it's true of China as well, um, because of their one-child policy, which, which means that the, the, there is going to be increasing difficulty in these countries in, main, in the working population making good on the promises that have been made to the retired or older population. And um, none of the, actually, the United States although it's having all this to do about social security and health care, is better off than almost any other rich country, largely because of immigration. Um, but every one of the... Our promises are smaller, too. Our promises are smaller, <laughs> too. That's true. But, um, uh, but the fact is that n no, none of these countries has figured out how to deal with these issues. And of course, China has the additional problem, which is ref <coughs> reflected in this question. <coughs> Excuse me. Will China grow old before it grows rich? Yeah. Because at least in the developed countries, they're rich enough so that they have some chance of dealing with this problem. China is still a poor country, despite the very rapid growth of income. And yet they're going to face the same problem as well while they're still poor. So for them, it's kind of a double whammy. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? <clears throat> Thank you for speaking with us today. Um, my, my question is kind of in two parts, um, but they're both based on a theme that I detected in your talk, which is that 
uh, a lot of the problems that have faced the developed world in recovering from the crisis of 2008 have seemed to be more of a political problem than an economic problem. And what I mean is that uh, in the view of many mainstream economists, the, the proper response would have been a short-term fiscal monetary expansion, followed by uh, paying down that expansion in the medium to long term. Uh, and so my question is, how would you formulate the argument, since you're speaking to a lot of future and current policymakers right now, how do you formulate the argument, both domestically, for something like a short-term fiscal expansion, for example, taking advantage of negative real interest rates to fund something like an infrastructure bank, and to the Europeans, convincing the Germans and the IMF that austerity went out of fashion in the 80s, and, and it's showing really poor results right now. So how, how would you formulate those arguments? And they could be different for different audiences. Well, I think you asked that. I'd be interested in Susan and Marina's answers to this question. So I think you ask a very, so there are actually two questions. Sort of one is how do we talk to ourselves, and the other question is how we talk to the Germans. Uh, and uh, and uh, I know, I mean, they are related in, in some sense. So they, they, when I'm being flip, I blame the professors. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I do do some teaching, so I but uh, well, I did at the beginning of my career and at the end of my career. But in between, I didn't. So I rang the professor. So these people went, you know, they learned their economics from these people, and then they did seem to have not learned it. And by the way, I have some classmates who graduated in the same college that I did, and I said, well, we all took the same economics. How come I learned something different than you did? Uh, 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 but but I think that that's illustrative of, in some sense, you don't. We have a. We first of all, you have different. Values that starts. That's one of the points. Uh, uh, but we don't rec always recognize the problem at the same time, and then we don't have the same diagnosis. Uh, and therefore, not surprisingly, we have different medicine uh, prescriptions for that for that uh, crisis. Uh, I mean, and it's certainly true that uh, uh, that that um, fiscal sustainability which is a little hard to actually, whatever you mean by that term, right, is, as opposed to unsustainability, uh, is to be preferred, right? Then the question is, how do you manage yourself around the fiscal sustainability? So is the, whenever you get off whatever the path is to fiscal sustainability, do you say, oh, well, we've got, we've got to go right back because, which is sort of a political economy question, because uh, the longer you stay away, the harder it is to going to get back, and uh, and the more difficult it is to push that, mixing my metaphors, that rock up the hill. Um, uh, or do you sort of say, well, we can handle this along the lines that uh, Professor Collins was suggesting earlier, right, where you have both a medium term and a, and a short term plan uh, at the same time, uh, which you could sell, not just. In the United States, to us, to the here, one would hope, but we didn't. Uh, and and tried. There were some efforts, but they were pretty weak. Uh, uh, and we certainly didn't sell it to our critics abroad. Now, the critics may be wrong, in just in terms of dealing with short-term uh, macroeconomic stabilization, but they're right in the they're certainly right for the reasons why Susan. Uh, uh, excuse me, Professor Collins asked, uh, asked the question earlier. I, I would say that we've got it exactly backward. And the reasons, I think, are, are not so much because the politicians didn't learn anything from EC 101 as because politics trumps economics pretty much every time. And what I mean by backward is, that, as Susan said, what we needed now was stimulus to get us moving again, but with a credible medium and long run plan for getting at the deficit. And that really means attacking entitlements. Now, what we've done instead is done absolutely nothing on the long term, and meanwhile introduced uh, a, a totally unwarranted uh, fiscal drag in the short term. Ted, what did you say was the, the CBO forecast? 1.4% they now have. 
Of on the assumption, I think, basically, that the sequester will, will be implemented. 1.4. But you also said that that's about what it should be? Or? No, no, no. Oh. It's, it's marked down. So the general forecast, I think, is sort of in the two-plus range these yes. days, right? So, mm -hmm. so the sequester takes three-quarters, I'm told by the experts, mm -hmm. three-quarters percent off of, of growth this year uh, uh, on top of everything else. So that gets you from two-and-a-quarter to one-and-a-half. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's, mm -hmm. I think, where you... Where the, that's a number. So it's, but that's, you know, that's flirting with, once you get down under near, around 1%, you can yeah. go into recession. That's the way numbers bounce around. <laughs> but uh, I don't think, as I say, that the reason is that the people, I was going to say down there in Washington, but I guess I have to say here, here in Washington, um, think that this is the right solution. It's just that, that for quite different reasons, people on both sides of the aisle think that it is the least politically costly solution. The one, I think one distinction is, and it, and it applies to a comparison of the European debt crises with the debt crises that you read about or knew about in emerging markets. So they all have political economies, right? But the emerging market crises are like the crises in Greece itself, right? They don't have any choice, right? They, they've been noisy about making the choice, but they basically don't have any choice what they have to do, right? right? And so at that point, the economics trumps the politics, to use your term, right? The economics trumps the politics. In Europe as a whole, right, the, because they're wealthy enough, right, the politics can trump the economics, and here too, right? So why we haven't addressed our longer-term problems? Well, the politics trumps the economics, and we're wealthy enough, in some sense, to be able to muddle through for a while. So I'm actually going to suggest something, because we're basically out of time, but I have folks who wanted to ask. Well, okay, so what I'm actually going to invite people to do is to come and talk with us during the informal time, and so we have other opportunities, um, as I hope everyone will stay, for us to continue this conversation. But since we are out of time for this part of our event, um, I wanted to thank Ted and Marina for joining me in this conversation. <laughs> Clearly, there are a lot of challenges, both for the U.S. economy, but more globally. And so uh, this is not a conversation that we have come close to ending. Um, I also wanted to thank all of you for coming and joining us here this, uh, this evening and um, hopefully continuing to think about some of the issues that we've raised. Um, we are also hoping that you will all stay and be active participants in our Student Alumni Network, which is the next part of our event. And I have to say is one of my, whoops, one of my favorite activities because it's an opportunity both to find out what a number of people are doing, but also to hear about interests of students who are looking forward to some of the careers that um, they are preparing for. And so um, a special thank you to all the alumni for coming here and for spending time talking to our current students and helping them with um, a number of the kinds of questions that they may have. As you, I hope, saw outside, we have divided things into a number of tables that are um, highlighted with different topics. And each table has a set of hosts. And so I'm going to ask. On behalf of me, Jennifer, Elizabeth, Amy, our, our team here, that you spend perhaps the first 20 minutes at the tables that are the most closely related to your interests or your current activities. And then uh, certainly, by all means, um, I hope you have a chance to catch up with all of your friends and, and others who are here with us this evening. So again, on behalf of all of us, we are delighted to see everybody and hope that you stay and enjoy the food and our networking reunion. So a final thank you to Ted and Marina. Let me get this. You're saying that the fiscal...